Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar from the Institute of Export and International Trade on developments in the IT that's used in customs and trade in the UK, a session we're running in partnership with iCustoms. And an apology for starting a couple of minutes later, we've just had a, a technical glitch with one of our speakers uh, trying to join the call, uh, which we're, we're working on in the background as well. But my name is William barnes Graham, the Executive Editor at the Institute. And I'm delighted to be bringing you today's webinar on an area where there's been so much change in recent years following Brexit and due to the UK's 2025 border strategy. Today we'll be covering some of these changes, including the Customs Declaration Service, or CDS, the new computerized transit system, also known as NCTS, the single trade window uh, and other developments in that space, and the rise of AI in customs compliance, among other things. It's a pretty huge topic for today, I'm sure you'll agree, but we'll hopefully give a decent introductory overview of the key developments that you need to know about. And indeed, we have extended today's webinar to one for an extra 15 minutes or so, because there is a lot to cover, and we wanted to ensure we have time to answer some of your questions. So we're going to vote on the next slide. Uh, it is my pleasure to introduce our excellent panel of speakers today. Uh, we're delighted to be joined by Andrew Hutchinson from HMRC. Uh, Andrew is a senior project manager at HMRC with vast experience delivering transformation projects across government. He is currently leading the migration of export declarations to CDS and will be presenting on that shortly. We're hoping to be joined at least in part by Lorna, who's the NCTS, Lorna Taylor, who's the NCTS 5 External Readiness Lead at HMRC. Um, Lorna is having a technical issue joining the call at the moment, unfortunately. So uh, if Lorna can't join, uh, she will be, uh, her, her slides will be covered by Matt Vick from the Institute of Exports and International Trade. Uh, Matt is a Customs and Trade Specialist who delivers a wide range of the Institute's public training courses, consultancies and qualifications and will be today updating on other future developments like the Ecosystem of Trust and the Single Trade Window. And finally, we're joined by Mark Denny, an advisor to iCustoms and a former Chief Digital and Information Officer at HMRC. Mark is a very accomplished technology executive with a strong background in digital transformation and strategic change. On the next slide, though, before we get into the presentations, we're just going to run a quick poll to find out a little bit more about you, our audience. So we are here going to gauge um, how prepared you are to make all of your export declarations on CDS uh, by 4th June, which is uh, the kind of the latest extended deadline for, for some users on CDS. So I'll give you a few minutes to answer that poll and I'll do some quick housekeeping notes while you're doing so. so Firstly, you can contact me with any comments or questions using the question panel on the control window, which is usually to the right-hand side of your screen. We hope to get to a number of your questions later on today, though please note we cannot guarantee we will get to every question in the allocated time. As such, I will be prioritizing questions that are relevant to the wider audience, so I won't be going into company or sector-specific queries as such. Please note, though, that if your questions are short and clear, I am more likely to be able to read them. Finally, you will receive a recording of a webinar and a follow-up email we will be sending over the next day or so. So I'll give you a few more seconds to answer that poll. Thank you everyone who has responded so far. So here we go, three, two, one. Let's have a look at how you responded. So quite a pretty well-prepared audience, I'd say. So 30% of you have moved all of your declarations already to CDS. A quarter of you have said uh, you're well-prepared that you'll, and you'll, that you'll make the deadline. 5% of you started and think you should be okay. Only 3% of you don't feel particularly well-prepared at this stage, uh, while 37% of you say someone else makes your expert declarations on your behalf. So quite a well-prepared audience, generally speaking. The next slide, though, at this point, I'm going to hand over to Andrew Hutchinson to cover today's first big development in UK customers, and one that is very much underway, as you can see from that poll, and that's been removed to CDS. So over to you, Andrew, to present on CDS. Thank you. Thanks, Will, and good afternoon, everyone. Um, and that is, as we said, really reassuring to, to see the, those numbers. Um, and, and for those, those of you who, who are uh, slightly less prepared the, the, than some others, hopefully this um, presentation will, will provide you some really useful information and, and, and help and a, a guidance on, on how to prepare for the move. 
Um, so yeah, during the session, I'll be reminding you of the timeline for migration to CDS, um, explain the key steps that you should take to prepare to start making CDS declarations, and also what help and support is available to help you make that move. Um, just on the next slide, please. So we, we wrote to all export declarants in March, um, outlining that all routes were now uh, open for CDS declarations um, and commencing the three month migration window, um, which means all declarations must be um, on CDS and no longer being made on chief by the 4th of June. Um, next slide, please. So um, some of you may have attended one of our previous webinars uh, and be familiar with the information that I'm going to present. Um, and hopefully this serves as a, a useful reminder if so. Uh, next slide. So ho hopefully by now um, you will have registered for, for CDS, which is the first key step in the process. Um, however, if, if you haven't yet registered, please do so, so now. Um, and if you do experience any issues when registering, you can use the, the Get Help uh, set button at the bottom of the page, uh, and our advisors will be able to help you if you are experiencing any issues getting registered for CDS. Um, and then you should then familiar yourself with the CDS export completion instructions. Um, the links to which are on the page, and, and you may know this as, as what was formerly known as the, the, the tariff. Next slide, please. Um, to help you prepare um, for this, we have prepared a series of YouTube videos, um, the links of which are, are detailed on the slide, um, and, and, and these should help you if you need some help and guidance um, on, on how to follow those step-by-step -step, um, processes through, through the online declaration guide. Next slide, please. Now, this is one of my most important slides, um, and I would really employ if you haven't already, or if you're, if you're just starting out on your, your migration journey to CDS, to make use of our trade address rehearsal service. It's a free to use service where you can practice um, making declarations. Um, it uses real account data. However, they are not legally binding declarations. They are uh, um, test and practice declarations in a live like practice environment. And we have seen throughout both imports and export migration to CDS that those who use TDR have a higher success rate and confidence upon CDS migration with lower rejection rates. Um, there are some functions that aren't available in, in TDR due to the, the trade address research service not being connected to other systems. So for example, GVMS, um, Chief, uh, and the closing of, of EMCS entries, um, just due to that, that our test service not being connected to those systems. The service is available now. It's available 365 days, 24-7, um, except for small instances where we have planned maintenance. And to get access to the trade address rehearsal service, you can access that through your software vendor's uh, product. So please do contact your software provider if you haven't yet got access to trade address rehearsal and would like to use that service. Next slide, please. If you do experience uh, rejections either in the trade address rehearsal environment or when you do go live on, on the customs declaration service, there are some self-help steps that you can take uh, to try and, and resolve that issue, which are detailed on the, on the page there. Um, the key one I would draw your attention to uh, is the CDS known error workaround document, because it may be that um, at this current moment in time, there is a workaround that we would require you to follow um, that, that you may need to implement for a short period of time. Uh, and that might be the reason why the declaration isn't performing as you were expecting. However, if you've tried this, these steps and, and still struggling to, to get the declaration through, um, you can contact our help desk by email for the, the trade address rehearsal or online through the report problem using the customs declaration service link on gov.uk. Again, both of those are, are on the slide deck. Next slide, please. Uh, we have recently launched the uh, Make and Manage and Export Declaration Online service. This is the, the NES service for Chief. It's free to use and aimed at small and medium sized businesses. And you can also use the service in the trade address rehearsal too. So if you are interested in, in this service, please email the team whose contact details are on the page there and they can arrange access for you. We will also be hosting a live stream event soon um, to demonstrate the service. Again, if you're interested in that, please do register from the, the link in the slide. 
Um, but please do not, again, you must have registered for CDS to be able to use this service. So again, if you haven't already um, made that step to register for CDS, please do so at your earliest convenience. Next slide, please. Um, we also wrote to all export declarants this week, um, just reminding you of the migration deadline of the 4th of June, and also explaining that there will be a limited exceptions process should your migration be impacted by uh, an HMRC IT issue. Um, we won't be granting extensions for any other reason, um, and details of how to apply are on the screen. We have a, a mailbox set up to receive those applications, and if you could provide the details in the bullets on the screen, that'll help us understand the reason for your request and allow us to, to make a decision and get back to you in good time. Next slide, please. Now, there are a number of resources online that can help you prepare and, you, and use the Customs Declaration Service. Uh, and these are all contained within the CDS guidance pages and the CDS communications pack. Um, again, all of the links are, are on the page um, and they're just really helpful resources that, that you can use to, to help, help you with migration to CDS, including that, that key differences between C Chief and CDS and, and also the um, workaround guidance is on there as well. Next slide, please. Perfect. But oh. um, yes, uh, thank you, Andrew. That was, uh, that was a great overview. No problem. Um, so you're going to say something? Yeah, apologies. I think we, we might have just missed the final slide, but it was just really to end on a, a it was just a reminder on where to go for help and, and advice. But we may have just missed the slide, but it was just a reminder that um, we have the Customs and International Trade Helpline. Um, we can provide the, the phone number after the, the event if that would be helpful for general queries. And and as covered in earlier in the slides, if you do have a technical issue when making a, a live CDS declaration, please do ra raise a, a, a request through the the online web page um, for uh, and our helpline will. I'll um, re respond in good time. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. We'll make sure that information is in the slide pack, which we will be sharing with all of you after the webinar. So there's a lot of information in that in that presentation where you will get access to a copy of this afterwards. And yeah, we can share those links in the follow-up email as well. We're going to now just run a quick poll. So we, we'll come on to a question for Andrew shortly. Uh, we've already had a few come in. But uh, just ahead of the next section, we just want to get a gauge on how ready you feel you are for the NCTS5, um, which is the new computerized transit system uh, update, which is coming this summer. So a uh, scale there between very ready and not at all ready. Um, Andrew, just while people are answering that poll, we've had a quick question in from Flora, who asks, what happens if I'm not ready uh, for making export declarations by 4th of June? Uh, so if this is due to uh, issues with making live uh, customs declarations, please do get in touch with us through the um, the, the, the email inbox and uh, one of our team will get in touch with you to offer support, advice and guidance to help you to help you prepare. That mailbox opens from the 1st of May. Um, so please do send that in a, a, as, as quickly as possible. And like I say, one of the team will, will have a look and, and look to, to help you prepare in good time. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you, Andrew. I hope that's helpful, Flora, and, and for anyone else who's got that concern as well. I'll quickly close the poll now and share the results. So, 40% of you aren't sure if you're ready yet for NCTS 5, so hopefully the, the next presentation will, will help you kind of get a clearer understanding. Uh, but although it's only 7% of you very ready, 28% of you are quite ready, so about 35, over a third of you are ready to some extent, and then about 25% of you aren't very ready at all at this stage. But it seems as though there's maybe not so much understanding yet around what NCTS 5 may mean for, for some of you, so let's hopefully uh, cover that in the next part of the webinar on the next slide. And unfortunately, uh, Lorna from HMRC has not been able to, to join the webinar, but thankfully, uh, Matt Vick from the Institute is uh, very on top of the topic and is uh, an expert on all things customs and trade, really. So Matt's going to very uh, manfully kind of stand in uh, and give a, uh, a presentation to, to Lorna's slides just on what's coming up with NCTS 5. So thank you Matt for stepping in and over to you for the next section. Great. Thanks thanks Will for the very uh, generous introduction there and yes apologies everyone but I will I will cover and I'll do my best to uh, to answer any of the questions you may have and 
hopefully help some of you that just answered that poll boost your your confidence about about the switch so next slide please first thing we'll do we'll just quickly run through a bit of background on what transit is and by extension ncts so transit is a method of moving goods and in simple terms ncts is the system you use to use that mechanism so the way we're talking about transit at the moment and ncts is purely four is the common transit convention, which is a agreement between, it's kind of easy to think of it as European economic area countries, a lot of those plus the UK. Now, in the lead up to Brexit, this was one of those things that was actually secured in its own right. We would have stayed a part of the CTC even had we not got a trade agreement with the EU. So this is an agreement that sits outside of the trade agreement with the EU or any of the countries within it, just, just to be extra clear. So transit's a mechanism where you begin a journey in, let's say country A, in the scenario perhaps in the United Kingdom. And for whatever reason, to get to your destination country, you might need to go through multiple other countries. Um, so let's say you want to go through to Ukraine or something like Turkey. Uh, of course, you'd have to transit through the EU on the way to do so. If you did not use transit, you would find yourself potentially having to do declarations um, for every country that you went through. And of course, that is both a time and cost problem. So transit helps remove that barrier by allowing you to raise what's called a transit administrative document. It's essentially it's its own declaration. And you use that document to cross the different border points in the intervening countries on the way to a destination. Once you reach your destination, you what we call close off the transit declaration by essentially completing the import declaration and um, in simple terms, firing a message back through NCTS that the journey is completed. So just to be you know, doubly clear, not everybody uses transit and you won't always need to by any means. It's most commonly used with things like road freight, as you might expect. Um, but for those, of course, that do use it, it is transitioning from the existing software, NCTS4, or Phase 4 as it's also called, into the new updated system called NCTS5. And we do know there's also an NCTS6 on the horizon much, much further away. So this is a update to an existing system. It's not a brand new one. Um, but it does also bring with it some what you might call quality of life changes as well. So just to make uh, just to make a note of the second bullet point there, when you enroll to use NCTS, you can do so currently through do two different pathways. You do it through what's called NCTS enrollment or what's also called, um, sorry, or the other one, which is called CTC enrollment. Um, something to be very aware of, as NCTS 5 is released, the NCTS enrollment will be phased out and the only one available will be the CTC enrollment. So um, do just check which way you have enrolled to your current transit system if you're using it, because if you're currently using the existing NCTS one, you must enroll with the CTC um, channel by the 1st of July this year. So just make sure you do that. And if again, if you're not sure, just check your authorization details um, in the back end and that will tell you which of those you've got. And again, just to be clear, make sure you enroll for the CTC one. That's the one that you need. So next slide, please. Um, I should mention there's there's two different types of, of methods of using NCTS. You can either do it through a third party software provider or you can do it through a government web portal. Both will still be available and both will absolutely still be options for you. Um, the reason I mentioned that comes a little bit important in a second because of these dates. So from the 20th of May, 2024, that was the aspirational date that HMRC will basically tell you to have your third party software ready for NCTS 5. They essentially want you to have several weeks time between the final date where you absolutely cannot use NCTS 4, which is 1st of June, as you can see here. So it's sort of like CDS where we're saying, make sure that you've actually got everything in place to switch before the last minute. Just give yourself some time uh, to prepare. And if there's any uh, adjustments you need to do or any standing data that you need to amend, you have a few weeks to do it that way. So. Just, just try and do so if you can. Again, that's if you're using a third party software provider. From the 1st of July, that's the date that all transit declarations have to go through NCTS 5. So if you are in a position where you're using a third party software provider and you're getting towards end of June, as we say, and you've not given yourself that time, if you're having problems, then you need to be making sure that you're ready to do it by this point. Uh, one of the things you can do is potentially switch to a different provider if absolutely necessary. Most mainstream software providers will actually, I think, be ready well ahead of this time. So you shouldn't have too much of a problem. But for any of you that are using perhaps a bespoke system um, or a much smaller one from a, from a bit of a smaller supplier, um, you might need to be in a bit more dialogue with them to make sure that this is handled um, on time for the mandatory switch. 
And from 22nd of January 2025, all CTC requirements are applicable. That is to say that there's no longer a phasing in. That's the absolute drop dead date um, that NCTS 5 will come through, including all of its features, such as digital TADs and so on, which we'll come to in just a bit. So next slide, please. So as we mentioned, there's a phasing in of the different functions. This is not something that's happening all at once. Those of you familiar with the, the BTOM, that will sound um, yeah, very similar. Um, not everything's happening at once. It's coming in over a period of a few months. So from the 1st of July this year, so in just a couple of months' time, you will be able to do the electronic MRN, as it's called, movement reference number. This is not to be confused, um, to be clear, with the MRN and CDS. They are two different things. Um, the MRN is basically the main number that tells different authorities that you have a transit declaration and you're able to use NCTS to get across the border. So the big change that NCTS 5 has brought is that currently you have to have a physical TAD, transit accompanying document that I mentioned earlier. Um, NCTS 5's big change is that we can now just have the MRN in electronic format. You do not necessarily need to have that paper document. So that's perhaps the biggest quality of life change for some. And it's going to be one of those that you might have existing haulers who prefer to have the paper copy, or as we see in the second point here, some offices might still require you to have a paper TAD. So it can be a case where you have digital MRN, but for whatever reason, you also still need to have a paper TAD. To be clear, the latter is still going to be available. Um, the nature of CTC is that it's an agreement between multiple different countries, and it's been actually, the implementation has been slightly delayed over the last year or so because Again, it's across multiple countries. Some countries were more ready to adopt the different measures than others were. So it could also depend on which office and which country you're trading with, whether they'll immediately accept the digital um, MRN. So that on that previous slide, when we said January next year was the drop dead date, that's more what that's referring to. Every member state of the CTC should be implementing these measures. The UK is just doing it um, a little bit sooner, arguably. Another thing that's um, actually changing, uh, sorry, previous slide, sorry. Um, another thing that will be changing is that at the moment, if you've got a transit shipment that you know is going to be departing and will cross over, for for instance, for the 1st of July and potentially any later dates, if you pre-lodge the entry, the transit entry, you will need to cancel that and do a new one when the new changes flip in, on the 1st of July. Um, sort of like CDS, whenever they do a major update, if you've pre-lodged and then a series of updates come through, you might find when you go to submit that pre-lodge entry, you get errors. We're expecting similar to happen here. You will need to actually cancel the existing one and just basically do entries from scratch from 1st of July. So just make sure you're aware of that and it doesn't hold up your trucks that you might have planned. And the other thing is commodity codes. You'll be able to actually optionally add the commodity code for each goods item in your movements. Uh, that's optional until 2025, at which point it'll be mandatory. So this is just phasing it in and getting you a chance to adapt to that requirement. Um, just remember commodity code on export tends to be eight digits. Um, so you don't necessarily need the full 10. Office of destination may though. So just make sure you classify your goods and you're aware of what they are. But because every movement still requires export and import declarations, you should already have this information. Next slide, please. And then from 2025, we actually have a lot more of the functions coming in online. So the new TAD layout will be available in 2025. As I mentioned, you can do the digital MRN, but the TAD will still be available in its existing format for some time. But from January, the new layout will be available and any new, any changes, any updates to the NCTS fields will be reflected there. As you said, also, because of the nature of the CTC, not every country is implementing everything at the same time. But 22nd of January 2025 is that drop dead date where they all should accept MRN in electronic format. So, again, this will depend on the countries you're trading with. So do please just check when you're starting transit movements, um, which is actually an option for you. You might still need to use the paper TAD we've said. There's also another fairly big change, which is the new role. So at the moment, we have Office of Departure, Office of Transit, and then you have um, the Office of Destination. There's going to be a new one, which is Office of Incident, which, as you can see here, is at the moment, if there's an incident, as it's called, they're recorded on the paper TAD and then recorded in NCTS once the goods reach the end destination, the Office of Destination. And then essentially a message is pinged back to the Offices of Transit and Departure along the chain. Um, the Office of Incident is going to be a different role so that if there's a problem with the transit movement for whatever reason, that goes through that office and it makes it a lot quicker process. It doesn't rely on the paper TAD and then a manual update at the other end. So this is more for those cases where there is a problem, which to be clear, in a lot of transit movements, there aren't. 
Um, this is just to help in those situations where it does potentially need quicker responses, because as you know, delays can lead to a truck sitting there, especially with road freight. It only takes a day or two for detention charges to start getting into the hundreds or even thousands of pounds. So the quicker that can be resolved, the better, and that will help with that. Commodity codes, as we've said, they're, they're optional from July, but as of 22nd of January, 2025, they will become mandatory. But just to reiterate, you should still have these because you're doing customs declarations anyway. And then the other thing is multiple house consignments. So you'll be able to group consignments into a single declaration now, rather than doing basically one for every potential item you might have. The upper limit is 1,999 house consignments, which each can have 999 line items, a bit of a mouthful, um, but there's a cap of a maximum of 1,999 line items per declaration. So this is a major increase in the number of different products you can have on each transit declaration in, in simpler terms. Uh, next slide, please. So hopefully that gives you an idea of, of what the dates are. Again, just to recap, the main ones is 1st of July is when we're starting to get the first phase implementation this year. And that will include a lot more optional switches, but just to be clear, switch in 20 TS5 will be required. And then 22nd of January is the main date where you must swap over. And as indeed must your partners at the um, destination or equal if it's an import, you yourself at, and in the UK will need to. If you're having problems with transit declarations at all, we do have a course called Moving Goods in Transit at the Institute. So if you want a bit of help or a bit of guidance on what you actually need to do and to actually put into a transit declaration, that course is available to help you through that and uh, hopefully leave you more confident in doing the process yourself. So with that, I will hand back to Will. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Um, brilliant job uh, covering covering uh, Verfa Lorna and covering NCTS5 and, and Transit in general. Uh, excellent presentation. Thank you so much. If we can just go back to the previous slide, um, just as Matt was saying, just a quick plug to say, but if you would like to learn more about transit procedures, do definitely look at our virtual training course on just this topic. Uh, there's a QR code which you can scan to get uh, onto the, the web page for it. I'll post the link in the chat in a moment as well. Uh, the course is delivered by our team of trading customs experts, people like Matt, and it includes a walkthrough of how to use MCTS and how to complete a transit accompanying document. Um, so yeah, um, on the next poll, you can say if you'd like to receive more information from someone from the team about this course. So I just launched that poll quickly. Right. Uh, Matt, thank you for, for covering there. We've, we've had some good questions come in already uh, about about transit and uh, I believe you're in touch with, with Lorna actually in the background to, to kind of make sure that you know you know what you're saying. But a question has come in from David who asks, uh, what happens if I'm not ready for NCTS 5 uh, for the 1st of July deadline? Yep, as you mentioned, the, the main thing that will stop you being ready in quote unquote is if your third party software provider hasn't actually updated their system to accommodate NCTS 5. Like I mentioned, I think most of the larger ones should be fine, just to be clear. But if not, and if your, your software provider is the bottleneck, you can use the government um, NCTS web portal instead if you need to as a stopgap until your standard supplier has made the swap or until you source a different software supplier to uh, to enable you to do it a bit easier. But yeah, the, the online government portal is, you, you're more or less filling out the exact same information. You just might not have the same automation features that you'd be used to. Um, but at the end of the day, the priority in that situation is still getting your transit entries through and that gives you a, a method of doing so. So, yeah, if that's a concern for you, just, just consider that and have it in your back pocket in case you do run up to the deadline and your provider's not yet ready. Terrific. Thanks, Matt. We'll have um, we'll have more more questions on, on transit and all the topics we we're covering today later on in the Q&A. But if we move on to the next slide, it's my time to hand back to, to Matt, who's also going to give an update on the single trade window and some other UK developments you may need to know about uh, this year and, and the years ahead when it comes to UK trade. So over, uh, well, back to you, Matt. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Thank you, Will. And uh, yeah, so we've got a we've we've covered some big changes that we know, and a lot of you will have been directly affected by, and that's that's CDS and that's NTTS. Those by far are probably the more common, uh, but we do also have a few other smaller changes on the horizon as part of a wider government strategy to to modernise the UK border. So we'll we'll take a look at those now. Next slide, please. Speaking of strategy, the big one kind of comes under the umbrella of what's called the ecosystem of trust, also just abbreviated to EOT. Um, this is essentially a part of the, the government's 2025 border strategy where they're hoping to create the most effective, efficient border in the world and essentially facilitate trade to the greatest degree possible. And we'll, we'll come on to all that in just a second. 
But what this means, ecosystem of trust, is a more sort of moving away from a transactional relationship at, with the border that most traders and HMRC will have. So in a standard movement of goods, you'll do your import and export declarations. You're essentially providing the same information each time, regardless of how strong your compliance history um, may or may not be. And the idea of an ecosystem of trust is that HMRC steadily builds a profile on different traders, gets to know their compliance and offers different facilitations. So if you want to use the carrot and stick analogy, it's more like the carrot, um, different authorizations like you know, AEO and, and um, authorizations like custom special procedures that will allow you to move goods across the border a lot more efficiently um, in return for you essentially proving long-term compliance. And this is, a, again, there's a lot of things that feed into this. Just on the slide, there is a couple bullet points of the main ones. So we already have a few in, in operation technically. So if we would take AEO that we've mentioned, you are signing your company up to a series of best practice promises, essentially, uh, and standards, including things like standard operating procedures, in conducting regular audits, that kind of thing. So for the work of making sure that you front load the process, HMRC trusts that you as a company have robust processes and you know, you're a legitimate actor. You're not trying to move anything across the border illegally. You're not trying to dodge taxes or anything like that. The idea is that you are a reliable company to trade with and HMRC won't need to target you as much for border controls like um, goods exams and documentary exams. So that's that's kind of the broad idea. You you prove that you're trustworthy, you get rewarded for it with a smoother process when moving goods across the border. In general, the idea is to essentially use data to do this. And a lot of the systems we've been talking about, CDS especially, you'll notice um, in recent months, if you've been using it, that it's probably asking for different data points than you saw with Chief. So you need to give more things like transaction information, related party, that kind of stuff. All that stuff kind of builds a data profile for HMRC about your trading activities and yeah, what, what the risk points are for them from a compliance perspective. So the way to think about this is you engage more in a relationship with HMRC as a trader. You, It's a lot less transaction. It's not you do entry, entry gets cleared, you move goods. It's HMRC will be more selective in, in future targeting. So next slide, please. A key pillar of the ecosystem of trust is technology. And one of the main instruments through which we can see this being implemented is the single trade window. So this is something that's been thrown around for a couple of years. And indeed, other countries around the world actually, in some cases, do have functioning single trade windows already. So it's not an entirely new concept. But in essence, it's a way of reducing data duplication. So let's say you are importing SPS goods and you could get a bit unlucky and your CDS import declaration requires documentary and or physical exam by the National Clearance Hub slash Border Force. But because your goods are SPS, you will also need to send the documents to Port Health and DEFRA. Under the current process, you will need to send the same information and the same documents to both government bodies slash agencies. And you're essentially doing the same thing twice. And they are each accessing the same info for what ultimately amounts to similar purposes. The idea of a single trade window is that you as a trader will submit all that information and documentation through to a single point. And from there, any relevant government departments or agencies that need to access that information can do so. So it's a streamlining of the process to reduce duplication and therefore delays and potential costs. So this has been in development for a little while. It's rolling out this year, towards the end of this year and early 2025. Um, testing and development is still very much in progress, just to emphasize. But again, there are existing ones around the world and a lot of other countries are looking to do similar systems. And part of the reason for that is a World Trade Organization agreement called the um, Trade Facilitation Agreement. So a lot of countries are looking to do something similar. This, again, falls into the ecosystem of trust. If you use a single trade window, um, the ultimate vision for a system like this is that almost every party that's involved in the supply chain could use it. So we have a close analog, which is uh, an existing what's called digital trade corridor between the UK and Kenya, which we abbreviate to TLIP. That's a system where even the exporter can send information directly through to HMRC on the UK side. They'll send things like the export documentation and information about the consignment, like the commodity code, value, weight, that kind of thing. It goes straight through from the exporter to HMRC. Um, they're all approved suppliers and approved parties, again, ecosystem of trust. Uh, so HMRC has ways of checking that that's still you know, legitimate and correct information. 
but it removes the requirement for this constant daisy chaining of documents and information across the supply chain until it eventually does reach customs at the destination. Um, but just to expand on that, the um, TLIP in Kenya, it's it's been going for uh, a couple of years now, actually. Time is skipping on. Um, but it's a very digital process. Um, when we say the sending of documents, one of the big things is that's not necessarily physical documents. It can be digital documents. So the ultimate vision of something like a single trade window is very similar. You have all the parties, you know, you can have one party send all the information once rather than have the exporter send it to the freight forwarder, potentially the freight forwarder to the importer or vice versa, them to government agencies, government agency back to the original importer and so on. The idea is to just streamline this process, reduce the instances of duplication. So um, it'd be quite exciting as and when this does come in. But the idea is, of course, it's part of that wider modernization process. Next slide, please. A couple of the systems to mention um, with the bigger ones out of the way. Um, starting off with the lighter changes, I'll mention IPATHs first. Of course, this is an existing system, but we do have the border target operating mod model measures coming in um, the next big bunch end of this month. So as and when those changes come in, of course, IPATHs will be continuously updated with different fields and documentary requirements. So just make sure you're aware of that and you're up to date on those changes. If you regularly use IPATHs, I'm sure you're very familiar with it by now. Um, but you will start to see the additional common health entry documents, et cetera, um, and, the, and the version with the stripped down data set for low risk goods, for instance. The other one I think is worth mentioning in the same vein of um, BTOM is SNSGB. For those not aware, this is um, the UK equivalent of the system that was mentioned earlier, which was the EU's ICS, Import Control System. Um, this is the system that processes safety and security declarations for the UK. Uh, again, quick explainer for those that are not sure. When you do a movement, let's say an import, you need an import declaration and a safety and security declaration is required. They are technically two separate things. In a normal import, the import declaration um, is separate and the SNS is handled by a haulier or a carrier um, as a general rule of thumb or perhaps their agent. Um, by contrast, on an export, a standard permanent export entry actually does include the export declaration, which is why you don't see that doubling of an entry on exports. So just quick explainer for those that are unsure. But the big thing to be aware of is that as part of the BTOM from the 31st of October, we will need safety and security um, declarations on imports from the EU. We don't at the moment. We do from the rest of the world, um, but we don't actually have them at the moment from the EU. So that's a big change that's going to come in. As I mentioned, this is slightly an issue for some because the burden often falls on hauliers or carriers to do those declarations. So you want to make sure that your um, hauliers are aware of that. And that's where SNSGB comes in. You can submit the um, declarations through there. Um, the other reason this is worth mentioning is there is a review into the data set on safety and security declarations, and it will be slightly reduced versus what it currently is um, by the time it's implemented on the 31st of October. So SNSGB will reflect those changes. Um, but the final system to mention is SPIRE, the current system through which you get your export licenses or check if you need one. Um, that is slowly, incrementally being replaced by another system called LIGHT. So essentially, same functionality, and it's still run by the ECJU, Export Control Joint Unit, um, but they're just making sure that it's going through a pretty thorough testing at the moment. It's still in, still in private beta, so that's not going to happen in the next year or so, don't worry. But once it does come through, it will essentially replace Spire. So for those of you that do need export licenses, if you are starting to see references to light in government email updates, etc., that's what it means. It's the new system that will be coming in. So do just keep an eye out for that. Uh, but with that, next slide, please. And I'll hand back to Will. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Uh, really great uh, overview there of, um, of some of the other big changes coming up. And uh, there's just so much going on in UK trade and customs. It's, it's, it's amazing. So thank you for giving that overview. And indeed, the single trade windows, especially, is something we'll be revisiting later on, later on in the year in our webinar program. I'm just going to do another poll now. I just want to find out what, uh, which is your biggest pain point with customs. So the options there being understanding rules, bureaucracy, costs, technology, implementation, and there's an other as well. If you do say other, do feel free to, to type in using the chat uh, what that other may be. Now, just as people are answering that poll, Matt, there's, uh, there's just, there's, as, as I say, there's a lot going on with customs at the moment in the UK. So what advice would you give to traders to ensure that they're staying on top of everything that's going on and changing? With so much going on, it is, is 
to be honest with you, sometimes quite difficult to keep track of everything. Because um, especially if you're a company that has your finger in, in many pies, for instance, if you you might use NCTS and CDS and be affected by BTON measures, etc. So the best way I can say to keep on top of it is, um, of course, government, gov.uk does have regular updates, both through email and other formats, including ones like webinars that they do. Um, so do keep an eye on those. You can subscribe to the specific areas relevant to you, and I strongly recommend you do so, especially things like CDS, because it will tell you about changes to individual data elements. Otherwise, you can look to follow bodies like the Institute of Export. We do have um, pretty much daily news that goes out on various platforms. So if you're a member especially, they will go direct to your inbox. So any changes that do happen, um, we do our best, of course, to digest it and, and, and make it as easy to interpret as possible. So if that's something that is uh, sounds of value to you, then of course, check that out. But you can also always use networks like LinkedIn and other other ways of networking with people in the same industry to to keep on top. Because sometimes someone finds a very obscure update that everyone else has missed, and that's a very fun way of um, catching those and, and having a bit of a debate as you do so, if you're sad like me. So yeah, try those options. Um, as I say, the main primary source, of course, is gov.uk. Terrific. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. I hope that's a helpful answer to, to everyone. And let's just see how people responded to that poll. So 50% of you saying understanding the rules is the biggest biggest pain point. Uh, just under a quarter of you, 23% of you said bureaucracy. 13% uh, of you say technology implementation. So that's that's quite encouraging. That, that's quite low. 5% uh, of you saying costs, interestingly enough, and a tenth other. Matt, is that, uh, is that about what you'd expect? Kind of the rules kind of do you navigating them and understanding them being the main issue for traders on the call? I think so, yeah. I mean, especially when you go through a period of such significant change in, in, in so many areas. I mean, the, the, the pace of change in the last sort of eight years has been way more than what we had in the, almost 15 years before that. So it has definitely been difficult even for kind of industry veterans to understand what's changed and where there's people that could do a chief entry in their sleep that, of course, have had to learn and adapt to CDS. So there's always that element that no matter how experienced you are, that's, that's kind of the the great and sometimes frustrating point of, of customs and traders in industry, which is that it's always changing. There's always something to learn. Um, bureaucracy, I think, kind of falls in the similar boat as the rules. Um, you know, you could argue that the rules sometimes bring bureaucracy and I fully understand the, the frustration with that. I am surprised to see cost as low. Um, a lot of the mainstream media outlets, of course, are starting to report on, on the BITOM and the expected cost potential of BITOM. So, I kind of expected perhaps that to be more um, high on people's radar, but um, it does show that for those that are actually dealing with it day to day, the, the, the bigger problem really is just navigating the rules, not necessarily the, the cost, even though, of course, it's a factor. So, yeah, very interesting set of answers. Thank you. Very interesting. And thank you, everyone, for responding to, to the polls today, uh, as ever. But on the next slide, uh, let's get on to the next presentation uh, before the Q&A. And uh, it's my delight to pass the mic to Mark Denny, an advisor to iCustoms. He's going to talk about uh, another really exciting technological advance for customs, and that being the kind of the potential solutions from AI. So over to you, Mark. Thank you, Will. Appreciate it. A very interesting presentation so far. So just jump to the next slide. So we've been going out from an iCustoms perspective, I am an advisor, but obviously seeing the data and iCustoms going out to the market to try and understand what the market is dealing with at the minute. Uh, one of the, the top things that does come back to us is processing costs uh, are significantly increasing as the complexity moves forward. We're definitely seeing um, manual input being a major complaint. It's everywhere, so everything's quite antiquated. And this leads to mistakes, delays, and sometimes getting your declarations wrong in terms of going out. Um, lack of customer support, and we're definitely starting to see that being felt in the mid and small market participants. Um, a lot of people providing feedback on that. Uh, software being legacy with little innovation. I think it leads back to some of the conversations that we're having today. I think the industry is moving at such a speed that there's little time for innovation. Everyone's just kind of struggling to keep hold of everything that's coming down the pipe so quickly and trying to adjust to it. So from an, from an innovation perspective, it's been installed while we deal with all the compliance kind of changes that are happening um, day to day. And then just the general complexity, I think you can feel it and see it in the presentations that have been given today. There's so much going on. The complexity is going up and up and up. Um, I do sympathise. I was the CIO for HMRC, 
So I know that we need good compliance at the border. It's all necessary. But when you do take a look at those systems, they're very disjointed. You have to um, put your data, similar data, into various systems. It's not consistent, et cetera, et cetera, right? So it does cause problems. It will get better as time goes on. But at the moment, you'd say the experience can be very disjointed and very disorientated, right, for people who are having to use these systems potentially. If we should move to the next page. Right, so lots of people talking about AI. It seems to be a buzzword at the minute. Lots of people talking about machine learning. And just wanted to give a few flavors of the types of things that definitely iCustoms are taking a look at at the moment and trying to bring it to life for people so they can hopefully see a bit of light at the end of the tunnel around some of the issues that might be facing. So the first thing uh, we're taking a look at is applying machine learning to document extraction and processing. Now, what does that mean? It basically means um, having a system that learns what an invoice looks like and being able to extract the invoice information, which is all applicable and needs to be transposed into a declaration for submission. Now, in the past, what you'd have, um, what, we've, what we've seen in terms of the process, those invoices come in, people pick them up, they interpret them, they take that information and they rekey and type it into a declaration type system for submission. And what we're talking about here is having a machine learning algorithm that can take a look at the invoice, it extracts the information, structures it, and automatically uploads that into a declaration directly for submission. It can be completely zero touch. Um, no one needs to touch it, it just takes the invoice and turns it into a declaration and submits it. But what we do is put a checkpoint in there to make sure that the machine is doing exactly what it's supposed to do. The machine learning bit is as we feed more and more invoices and show it more and more invoices, it gets better and better and better across the whole piece at dealing with any type of invoice. So it really does come down to um, feeding more and more data to it. The machine actually learns what an invoice looks like and does the job better and better and better. At the minute, we can get it to um, an accuracy rate of 99%. So it's very, very, very accurate and it's very quick. Um, the whole process can reduce the timing down by about 90%. So it's very, very quick in terms of what it does. So just a, a, again, a general feel for how machine, machine learning can be applied to some of the issues that people are struggling with today. Another one from a machine learning perspective is um, we can develop algorithms and rule engines. And what they do is they pre-screen and pre-fill. So instead of having to start from scratch every single time, the machine knows uh, that this is a particular type of form or pre-fill that's required. And what it will do is it will take your base information and pre-fill name, address. It'll put all the salient underlying information in there, which accounts for between 60 and 80% of the information that needs to be pre-filled. And it leaves the person who's doing the rest just to fill in what really matters and adds value to what needs to go into the form, for example. And again, as we go on and feed more information into the machine learning algorithm, it gets better and better and better at predicting what needs to be filled in and starts to fill more and more over time. So again, another, another good example. Um, the third point on here kind of just talks to the same thing. So it's just auto filling entries based on previous submissions. So we can do individual fields, but what we can also do is looking at full auto uh, filling entries. So again, you know, auto filling uh, entries up to about 80 to 90%. So it just leaves a small amount on top of that to be done. From a generative AI perspective, uh, we have classification tools and what they're doing is they're looking at you filling out the declaration and then what they will do is automatically prompt and suggest accurate HS codes. What we see in the market is, is this is a real pain point for organizations. And after talking to many, 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 um, there's a lot of worry out there that people are uh, not accurate with their HS codes. And this applies to small, medium and large uh, organizations who are getting it wrong. Now it can go both ways. Obviously there's an issue here in terms of taxation. So you, you should get it right. 
Uh, it could be in your favor, but it could also be not in your favor as well. And it could cause an issue with the authority. So you want to be as accurate as you possibly can. And our system basically automatically prompts based on what you're adding as a description. And we have it at over 99% accuracy again, in terms of um, suggesting HS codes, restricted goods, and also duties as well, which is really good. And then what we've also done is built modules that help with customer service queries. So just, you can again, train generative AI, you can provide canned answers, you can get it to be very, very flexible. And as it goes on and it sees people ask questions in different ways, it's almost like a machine learning learning and, a, and a, an algorithm that learns over time and it becomes more sophisticated in terms of dealing with customer service queries coming in. Again, lots of success with that. You know, we can see how it can be applied across many elements of the trade space um, and we're kind of doing training and, and applying that to different applications, you know, as we go basically. So that's just a few different ways that we can actually do it. I mean, what we're trying to do is we're trying to take AI and machine learning from abstract um, and then really trying to bring the whole trade and customer space into the 21st century so we can benefit from some of these great tools, algorithms, and machine learning and generative AI tools that are out there as well. So it's very exciting and we think this is only the, the start of a, a long journey in terms of applying some of these tools. Let's go to the next slide. And that's it. Just like to thank you for your time. And I think we're now going to go back to Will for questions. Terrific. Thanks, Mark. That's a really fascinating uh, presentation. It's great. It's so interesting to see how some of these kind of uh, solutions about machine learning and AI can really potentially support traders going forward. So thank you for the for the presentation there. And if you'd like to receive more information about iCustoms, I've posted a link in the chat, but you can also uh, respond to this uh, poll question as well. Uh, and say yes, if you'd like to receive more info from about their uh, customs compliance solutions. Um, so really interesting organization. And thank you, Mark, again for the presentation. Just people answering that final poll. Uh, we've had a few questions come in. A question that's come in from Stephen is, could you give us an example of how businesses can increase efficiency in their customs processes through use of cutting edge technologies like AI? So I guess expanding on a presentation, potentially an, uh, an example or two. Yeah, I mean, there's many, many ways. Um, you know, one of the primary ways that we see is that and it was alluded to in Matt's presentation, there's a lot of duplication in terms of um, when you're filling forms out, when you're looking at a particular movement, you have to fill the same information multiple times. Um, what we're doing is we're definitely applying these tools to be able to pre-populate as much as possible. Now, it sounds minor, but it saves a huge amount of time. That can save up to 70 to 80% of the time it takes to do, to do a submission on the various systems that are required. And then the other one, definitely, which is incredibly successful and really blows people away, is you know moving from extracting information from quite a scrappy invoice. You know we can deal with uh, very unstructured data laid out, not the same way every single time. And what we can do is we can transpose that into a standard set of information and then apply that directly to a structured declaration that then can be submitted into CDS. And again, that can save save upwards of 90% of the time it takes to do that process. And that process can be very lengthy, as people know on the call. So there's a couple of really good examples. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. I hope it was uh, useful, Stephen, and for everyone else as well. So have some really interesting examples there. Let's let's close that poll and go into the next slide as we get into the Q&A. And it's, uh, it's great now to be able to welcome back Matt and Andrew as well. So just on the next slide, please. And we'll, yeah, perfect. So first question, I'll put it to, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me. I'll put this question to Andrew, just to bring you back into, into the swing of things. Uh, so Sylvia has got a quick question, which is just asking, what is the current response time for the HMRC technical team? Thanks, Will. Yes, yeah, so um, for, Queries around problems raised through the online uh, gov.uk form. Uh, if the query is deemed to be urgent in nature, we would look to respond within two hours. Um, all other queries would be looked for response within 24 hours. Perfect, very succinct answer. Thank you, Andrew. That was helpful. Sylvia, uh, 
we had a question in which I'll put to, to Andrew initially and then be interested in hearing Matt's input as well. Um, so this question is, you know, to what extent will, H, will HMRC be ready for the respective deadlines around CDS and NCTS 5? So yeah, Andrew, just into the CDS first, kind of how ready do you think HMRC is going into 4th June? Yeah, uh, thanks. For, so in, in terms of, of um, sort of both IT and and business readiness, we are absolutely ready for, for the 4th of June. Um, I, in the presentation, I, I mentioned that um, we opened up all export journeys available on CDS, that all declaration types to be able to be made um, through both inventory and non-inventory linked locations um, on the 3rd of March. Um, and, and that that started that three month window ahead of the, the 4th of June. So the IT is ready. We, I do recognize that there are some workarounds that need to be applied um, at the moment um, so that declarations can successfully be made. Um, but we'll, we'll hopefully over time, we'll be able to remove those workarounds, but that, they are in place so that those declarations can be made successfully. Um, and, and from a business perspective, we absolutely have all, all the, the staff trained and in place and um, ready to support customers, both in preparing to use CDS and once you are live. Thank you, Andrew. And Matt, do you, do you have anything to add? I mean, cognizant you're not uh, HMRC yourself, but um, you've been through the process, I guess, recently with the imported deadline of CDS and, and exporters now. Kind of, how, how do you think? HMRC is set for these kind of upcoming deadlines. I, I, I broadly agree with Andrew. I think there's there's some problems, of course, as mentioned, there is a workaround document for a reason. And what tends to happen is that's for more specific cases, like there can be very specific procedure code, additional procedure code and commodity and certain destinations, perhaps pairings that cause a problem. But for most people, the kind of standard import, the standard export by this point, by which I mean um, free circulation import or permanent export, they tend to work fine and you know there can be some issues around people having problems with the entry but that's sometimes more what information goes in i think just yesterday more of the export example scenarios got published on gov.uk as well um so if people were having issues knowing exactly what goes in which field um government guidance is being continually updated and we knew that was coming um yeah otherwise though i know people do have some problems absolutely um and of course we've we've got our own services to help with that but um yeah, we do tend to find it's it's the more kind of non-standard, if you will, goods and movements that have the most um, hitches. So yeah, I think it's it's just one of those. Um, give it time. It's, it's there's some points of frustration, of course, but as time goes on, um, it will become more or less second nature, just as Chief was. Thank you, Matt. Thank you, thank you, Andrew. Uh, we've had a question in from Louise. It's about transit. So Louise has said. If we use the online portal, do we still need to ensure we are enrolled for C the Common Transit Convention? How would I find out if we are enrolled in CTC? Uh, we've been advised by the NCTS team that we are set up NCT NCTS5 under our gov .gov business account. Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll take that. Um, you can see which one you've got on your government gov.uk portal where you can sign in. I think actually we've got a link somewhere as well, if that's um, not already around. Um, to answer the question of do you need to be signed up to um, NCTS, etc., you need to be signed up to use the portal and or a third party software. So yeah, sort of like um, with CDS, you need to be on the dashboard, even if you do um, you know, just exports, just imports, etc. So yes, short answer is sign up regardless of which way you submit them. And I think and actually on the same government portal is where you can see which of those two NCTS or CTC um, sign up pathways that you've gone through. So again, just to emphasize, you need to be on the CTC one going forward. Perfect, thanks. Thanks, Matt. Thank you, as usual, Louise. Uh, we'll bring in a question, a broader question, so we can bring uh, Mark in as well on this one. So uh, this is a question from Sylvan, who says, from a technological perspective, what do you think the future of customs could look like? What a great question. Mark, do you want to start with that one? Yeah, I think the um, you know the future is going to look like exactly what Matt was explaining <laughs> in a way. You know, that's where we're going to probably in the next five years. It's going to be single trade window. It's going to be trusted traders. Um, so you know that's definitely the direction that the government's moving in. Um, I think what we can also do is 
we can try we can try to apply very modern technology methods like we've been talking about we can definitely do ai we can definitely do machine learning off the top of that um you know if i take a look at it and, and you know, obviously i was hmrc i was the cio um, when brexit happened so i was responsible for the technology at the border so you know i really understand these systems inside out i understand you know the limitations you know the potential disjointedness of everything um that exists today but you know where we're going to be going to is we're going to be going to a single trade window we're definitely going to be going to trusted traders and then what we can do is we can start start to bring some of this modern technology in that really eases some of the bureaucracy and the pain um, of using these multiple systems and obviously having to kind of pre-fill and do things like that. So um, I think that's my answer, right? I think, you know, watch this space in, in terms of a single trade window, that's definitely the answer. It makes it a lot more um, easy to be compliant and uh, a lot more efficient as well. Matt, Andrew, anything to add to that? It's, it's quite an exciting answer, I think. It's, it's uh, yeah. better times ahead. Yeah, um, it's it's one of, and just for a bit of context, just just for those that are aware, I mean, it's not that government has had a barrier to modernization before in in a philosophical sense. There has been some regulatory issues in recognizing, for, for instance, digital documents as the same legal footing um, as physical ones, which has recently been somewhat rectified by the Electronic Trade Documents Act. So there have been regulatory barriers, which of course have had to be changed first. There was also the previous kind of entanglement with the EU. Union Customs Code, which meant we had to follow a same similar rule book to a lot of others. So, you know, post post Brexit, we don't have to align in quite the same way. So, yeah, we do have that flexibility to switch at how we approach our border. Of course, there's still international obligations around that. We must still um, control what comes in and out for the safety of the population and the economy and so on. But definitely where government can, and we can see this in, in pretty much all directions, they are looking to minimise the controls and what happens at the border and move it essentially away from the border to to if you want to visualize it to your company premises in a sense um where you in a way have more control so it's kind of as i said when we introduce an ecosystem of trust it's that two-way street of you prove you're trustworthy and that you're a leg legitimate actor you get the facilitations and an easier time moving your goods and for the government that increases activity and therefore hopefully boosts the economy on the larger scale so um Maybe it's a bit of an evangelical answer, but it's hopefully a win-win all round. We like win-wins. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, Mark. Uh, really great answers there. We've had a couple of questions in from Dale. So one question is, Matt, are you aware of the difference of the number used in the simplified declaration and the supplementary declaration? I am told this happens only in the UK, um, but was not aware of this. Nice uh, technical question before you there, Matt. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. So of a bit of a quick discussion at the back end of this i think i think we assume you're referring to the safety and security declarations more than anything um there are changes to supplementary declarations for cds that's a separate thing but given that we didn't mention that i'll assume not on about it um yes we do know in if you look at the border target operating model there is a specific commitment to reducing the data set of what you actually have to fill out and i can tell you that the mandatory fields will be reduced to 20 and uh, there's nine sort of conditional slash optional ones that will go alongside that depending on the, the circumstances of the consignment so there is a reduction i think from memory please don't quote me i will have to go back and, and find it because there's no direct comparison i think that's a reduction of about i want to say 30 percent so i'll double check that afterwards but th there is a reduction and if you go on the border target operating model there is a page which tells you exactly which data elements will still be mandatory and which will be optional if you want to go and check that out Terrific. And, and Dale's second question has just come through. Uh, he says, do you see the trusted trader schemes replacing AEO or other schemes more for SMEs? So <laughs> um, the, the thing to, to kind of get square is, is that AEO and other schemes like that are trusted trader schemes at the end of the day. It's an authorization in which you prove, in which you prove your compliance. The thing is, of course, there are multiple ones. Um, Northern Ireland has its own under things like Northern Ireland retail movement and, and so on. Um, but we do also now have separate schemes in the Baton for SPS goods only of the AOS um, for plants and plants products, for instance, um, and, and so on. So an and ATTP, I think. So for the most part, you can think of any authorization through which you have to prove business compliance and you know legitimate activity as essentially a trusted trader scheme. To an extent, so is getting authorizations to use things like customs warehousing and inward processing, outward processing and so on. 
you are in all of those cases committing to provide information about your business and how it runs and how transparent and how um, legitimate you are in return for facilitation. So we already have trusted trader schemes in a sense. It's just that they've been, um, I think it's fair to say somewhat disjointed in HMRC's own words, they they reach something like 42 different authorizations. So there's a big focus to strip strip that down to to groups of about six, six roughly groups. Um, and we covered this in a, in a lunch study recently, but yeah, it's it, it's how we see it going forward. And of course, HMRC wants to encourage uptake. The, the big difference between the UK and the continent um, is things like AEO in a lot of EU countries are mandatory to access things like special procedures, like customs warehousing and so on. You must be AEO registered first. In the UK, you don't. Um, so we're kind of a bit more lenient in that sense. So yeah, we're, we're in the process of, of streamlining that, but you can already essentially be part of a trusted trader program um, just by having authorizations. Really interesting. Thanks. Thanks, Matt. I mean, and uh, Mark, I saw you, you saw you nodding along there as well. I mean, it's I'd just been interested to hear your sort of view as a kind of former HMRC person, I guess, looking looking in from the outside now. Can I, how, how do you view some of the changes going on just in, in terms of some of the trusted trader schemes and the simplification of authorizations which is going on? Yeah, I think I think what you've got is right, you've got to remember that um, as we went through Brexit and everything else, we took we took what we had within the government and then we built upon that infrastructure and we've added new bits in right to bring ourselves to be compliant at the border right and it's definitely not ideal right so if you take a look at it from a, an infrastructural perspective and from a compliance point of view it makes it more difficult for people moving goods and it also makes it more difficult for the government to ensure compliance right and matt you'll agree on this right nothing is lost within HMRC and nothing's lost in the government in terms of the difficulty that that presents. And, you know, what you have when you talk to ministers and you talk to the government, um, you have a real understanding that what we need is we need a frictionless border. That's what everybody talks about constantly. And, you know, that's been channeled into this single trade window. It's been uh, channeled into this trusted, trade, uh, trusted trader scheme that's going to be put in place. And that's the way they see it in terms of, you know, generating more movement at the border, making it more frictionless. And then, you know, what we can't forget is that it all ties back to the economy. You know, they want to drive the economy. They want to flourish an economy for the country and so on and so forth. Right. So there's a huge amount of pressure to move it from where it is today, which was Brexit plus legacy plus to something way, way more sustainable in the future. It's just, you know, to to do Brexit, you know, it couldn't be perfect on day one, but there's a lot of pressure to basically move to something a lot more streamlined, a lot more in line with, you know, what we want to see at the border from a trade perspective and an economy perspective as well. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks, Mark. Thanks, Matt. Um, some some great info there. Let's just do one last question. It was from Sylvia. It's it kind of more of a comment, but it's about single trade window, which we haven't talked about. Well, we have talked about it quite a lot in the Q&A, but it's more explicitly to do with that, this comment. Uh, so Sylvia says, a single trade window will be the cost effective solution for mandatory EU safety and security declarations on the first phase, as these will be able to be done via STW uh, free of charge. Some forwarders may charge ridiculous fees for declarations. So many look up to the UK single trade window as a solution, I think, especially SMEs. So just in terms of, I guess, managing those charges and um, you know, making these declarations more affordable, how important is, is the single trade window? Matt, if you want to start on that one. Yeah, and, and you'll find absolutely no disagreement for me. A, a, a single platform through which essentially free to use at the point of service, as it were, is, is going to benefit most everyone. Uh, I say most everyone, there's a few people that having a platform where you can do declarations through for free becomes a slight competitive issue. And you can guess what I'm alluding to there with software providers. Um, but yes, yeah, sing single trade window will be a great way of doing your security declarations, your hopefully eventually customs declarations and things like that. The thing to remember is that the way the timeline is currently set out, the requirement for safety and security declarations from the EU will come in before most of the functionality for single trade window comes online. So there'll certainly be a period where you still need to use um, either GBSNS or software providers to do those um, safety and security declarations. So do just be aware of that. But yes, it's absolutely true. And that's, that's the hope for something like the single trade window, which is that this becomes an accessible, um, cost effective way of doing most of the obligations, if you will, um, that arise from an import or export of goods. So yeah, it's it's exciting for that reason, but it just has to be tempered, I think, slightly by 
realism on there are parties that will not, not necessarily agree with that approach and there's also uh, still plenty of development to go for the single trade window before it's at full um, full functionality. Thanks, Matt. Um, we'll try and squeeze in a couple more questions. We did start slightly late. So a question from Louise says, uh, is transit regulation still under the EU? Have previously <clears> been advised, <throat> yes, this authorization is still regulated by the EU. And so I think that's in reference to CT CTC. Um, Matt, do you want to take that one? It's, uh, I, I sort of mentioned it before, which is that it, it's one of those that's a bit difficult to answer simplistically. It, it's not inherently a part of the EU. It, it's an agreement that happens to include the EU and therefore all of its member states. Um, yes, it is extremely EU-centric and all of the countries that are signatories must follow um, the rule book that it sets out. But CTC, um, I mean, we've seen in the fact that it was the implementation of NCCS fine was delayed. Individual countries can absolutely have a say in saying, by the way, we're absolutely not ready to implement this, we need to delay, et cetera. So it's not kind of like a top-down um, forced through policy. It is it is between different countries. So the short answer is, no, it's not technically EU in practice. Of course, they are the biggest voice and biggest share of its membership, so they have a huge influence. Um, but it is a collaborative thing, CTC. There are other transit programs. Um, there's other things of like Carnets, which are other solutions, if that's a issue as well. But because um, it doesn't cover everything. Um, it only covers the, the states, of course, that are, that are signatories. So, yeah, in, in practice, I have to say, it doesn't really matter as such. You know, the UK will implement the rules and having that common rule book allows you to use transit. And at the end of the day, the, the goal there is use of transit because it is such a, a great facilitation for, as we say, those movements where you have to cross multiple borders. Um, and collaboration between multiple countries is absolutely required for that to even work. So there's always going to be that element of, of politics and, and bureaucracy to it. Thanks, Matt. Hope that's helpful. Uh, Louise, I'll be about questions from. Um, I think we are probably going to have to start wrapping up now. Uh, so thank you, everyone. There's so many great questions, and we couldn't get to all of those questions. Um, if, if you know, if you do have questions you want answered after this, do look at the, the Institute's uh, support for, for its members on, on things like this. But uh, a big thank you to, to Andrew uh, from HMRC, uh, to also for, for Lorna from HMRC. Sadly, she couldn't join the webinar, but she did prepare the presentation. So thank you very much to Lorna. Uh, Mark from My Customs, thank you. Some really great answers there and a great presentation on AI earlier. And to Matt as well from the Institute for the pres Presentations earlier and, and for covering for Lorna too. So thank you everyone uh, from the panel. Some really great information there. And I, and I do hope that, that was useful for everyone. And thank you again to iCustoms for partnering with us on this webinar. On the next slide, though, just a quick reminder that the Institute, sorry, we'll just move next slide, please. Quick reminder that the Institute provides plenty of support for businesses involved in exporting and customs, including webinars like this. Membership at the Institute gives you access to a wide range of benefits that help your business succeed overseas, including exclusive access to our lunchtime learning webinar program, which is a more specific webinar program, which looks at some of the areas mentioned in today's webinar in a bit more detail. There's discounts on our training courses, there's exclusive guides and insights on trade trends and regulatory changes, access to our team of trading customs experts via our technical helpline, as well as networking opportunities with fellow traders and trade professionals. I posted a link in the chat to membership um, and please do go to the website as well for more information. Uh, next slide, please. Here you'll see some of our other upcoming webinars and events. Tomorrow, we're running our next member exclusive lunchtime learning session, which is looking at how to claim preferential tariffs using the EU UK Trade and Cooperation Agreement. Our next free to the public webinar is on the future of the UK EU trade deal in general, including some excellent speakers from the Institute for Government, UK and Exchange in Europe, and the Society of Motor Manufacturers and Traders. And we've also got a couple of in-person events coming up this summer, including a regional event in Newcastle in May for our members and our annual members conference, MemberCon in Leeds in early July. Uh, for more information on all of these exciting events, please do go to export.org.uk forward slash events. On the final slide, uh, just again, a big thank you to everyone for listening in. A reminder, we will be sending the slides and a recording of today's webinar in a follow-up email, which you should get in the next day or so. Please do get in touch if for any reason this email doesn't come through to your main inbox. Uh, but thank you again for joining us today's webinar. As you leave, please let us know what you thought of today's session and any suggestions for topics and future events by completing the short exit survey. Bye-bye. Thanks, everyone. Have a good thank rest everyone. of the day. Thank you.